Welcome back, students. So to speak, uh, this lecture slash video is on color. This will be one of your two final projects for class. It'll be due on May 15th. I'll post a video for the other final project in the next day or so. Um, this will be your last, also your last comic assignment. Now the sort of history of color um, could be said to be one of continual expansion. That's like a crude reduction, but it's more or less true. We'll talk about that a little bit today, as well as some, as some basic color theory and how to use it on your projects. Now, as I said, crudely speaking, and with some exceptions, the history of pigment is one of constant expansion, uh, expansion of the numbers of colors. The material that is used to make color is pigment, um, usually uh, minerals or other material or chemicals. Um, here you can see an image of a cave painting uh, from Argentina from about nine to 12,000 BCE. Um, pigment is a material that changes the color of reflected or transmitted light as a result of wavelength selective absorption. Basically, how much light is absorbed by the pigment determines the color. One interesting thing to note about these handprints that are found in cave paintings all around the world is that studies of the size of the handprints would tend to indicate um, that at least half of the artists in cave paintings uh, that made cave paintings um, were probably women. This has overturned a lot of assumptions about cave painting over time. As time went on, more and more color, uh, more and more pigment sources were brought in to various empires in China, the Roman Empire, and so on. Um, and this expanded the color palette of artists. Uh, I was still limited, we think. Very few Roman paintings, almost all painted on walls, survive. A lot of the ones we have left are the ones that were from Pompeii, where they were sealed by, by volcanic ash. Um, one interesting thing that we've discovered using science is it was assumed that Roman, ancient Roman and Greek statues were bare marble, um, uh, black and white, sort of. Um, but new science suggests they were actually painted in vivid colors. And this has become a point of contention with basically racists. Um, and of course, I, usually in class I ask you all why you think this might be a point of contention. Um, and one of the reasons is, is ancient Rome was a multiracial society, um, although they had no modern concept of race. Um, basically, they divided people into what they considered civilized and barbarian. You could have black or brown skin and be civilized, white skin and be barbarian, according to Roman ideas. And if Roman art were to be seen in color, it would undermine racist assumptions about like the ancient world, seen by some as the foundation of Western society. So here you see a mosaic of a Roman citizen, and on the right you see the first African-born emperor of Rome. In the 12th century, here's an example, um, a wooden panel of a uh, virgin, uh, Virgin Mary, who was attributed to the miraculous creation of the evangelist St. Luke. In this composition, the Virgin cradles the Christ child in her left arm and points to one with her right hand. You can see colors are still limited, um, but they've expanded a little bit more. They're still assigned meaning. Um, the Christ child is in red. Mary is almost always depicted in blue, which was a rare and hard to get pigment. You have gold leaf, um, demonstrating wealth, obviously, and purple mixing the two together, which is a sign of earthly power and royalty. Um, with the Renaissance and the rise of global trade, there's an expansion of colors. Um, at the same time, though, artists are still grinding their own pigments and mixing them with oil or other mediums. So this still limits the number and kinds of color available. Here's another Renaissance painting by Vermeer. You can see that there's a good amount of color here, but it's still fairly limited. There's still a lot of earth tones. Here's a Rembrandt painting also showing, um, in particular, the depiction of the, quote, oriental, unquote, rug, um, colors that would not be so easily available before. But well up into the 1800s, <coughs> excuse me, you still have a fairly limited palette, as in uh, the Corbet burial at Ornans painting we've looked at before. But something happens within, a, within just a few years after this painting was made that dramatically increases the number of colors available uh, to artists. And again, usually I ask you all um, in person what you think this might be. 
Um, here's another example. Uh, this is from the early 19th century, a painting I've shown before, Goya's Execution of Peasants on the 3rd of May. And then here, uh, just a few, uh, few decades later, um, a similar painting, partly inspired by Goya, by Manet, the execution of Emperor Maximilian, who was a puppet emperor in uh, Mexico that was installed by the French. You can see how much more color there is. What happened, basically, uh, was there was the Industrial Revolution, the mass production of tubed and, and canned and jarred oil paints. These, uh, in this picture, are acrylic paints. You'd have to wait until the 20th century for these. But the mass production of paint created a lot more color options. And this is reflected in a lot of the art that comes after uh, sort of the middle of the 19th century. Here's a late 19th century still life by Cezanne. Here's a Renoir painting from the late 19th century. Picasso, early 20th century. Now here you have a more muted color palette, almost monochromatic, but not quite. And because once all this color is available, after artists sort of use it and explore all the new color options they have available to them, then it becomes much more about a conscious decision about what color schemes you want to make based on this huge choice. Now, of course, artists had always been making conscious decisions about their color schemes, but those were constrained by the number of pigments that were available. So you see color taking on a much more starring role in art in the 20th century. Um, here's a painting by El Lizitsky on the left and a painting by Rothko on the right. Also, I encourage you, um, once you can go outside safely again, uh, to see these Rothko paintings in real life. They're actually, um, if you stand in front of them and stare at them, the color envelops you. Reproductions don't do them justice. Here's a painting by Ad Reinhardt, Mondrian, Helen Frankenthaler. It's almost like a colorful cave painting in some ways. Here's Helen Frankenthaler in a publicity shoot in her studio. Now, even when we're dealing with color, I want you to think about um, the social meanings um, that are associated with various things. So, for example, take this publicity shot of Helen Frankenthaler, American Abstract Expressionism from the mid-20th century, and compare it to this publicity shot of Jackson Pollock working in his studio mid-20th century. They're both part of the same art movement. What are the key differences here? Well, one, they've used a very soft lens in depicting Helen Frankenthaler's work. It's in color, obviously, and she is not painting, and she's moreover not probably wearing the clothes she wore to paint those paintings. Whereas on the image of the left of Jackson Pollock, it's black and white. He's in action, and so on. So Jackson Pollock in this place is, is, is active, and Helen Frankenthaler is presented as passive, even though if you look at her process, it probably had many similarities to Pollock's. Color continues to expand um, throughout the 20th century, particularly because of acrylics and other techniques used to make colors, expanding constantly with technological innovation. But also artists sometimes reacted against this expanded color palette, intentionally using limited color palettes to try to communicate something that they felt was more stark or elemental or ancient. You can see that in these paintings by Anselm Kiefer. Or in this Robert Rauschenberg painting from the mid 20th century called Canyon. It's sort of a relief sculpture slash painting. Of course, what would have taken weeks, years to produce, if at all, in cave paintings, months in ancient paintings, weeks in Renaissance paintings, days in modern paintings, can now be approximated in seconds because of digital color. Now, this gives you a great amount of freedom, which means you need to, like, master how these colors communicate, both in terms of their formal visual qualities their cultural and their cultural associations and the meaning you want to communicate. Now, color theory is a very complicated subject. We don't, we're not going to be able to go into all of it. You should, if you're going on in art and design and color is going to be an important part of your work, you should probably consider taking a color theory class. Um, and it's understood differently also by scientists, printers, and designers, and painters. Subtractive color, where mixing all the hues will create black, is what oil painters 
general use. And some grasp of this theory will help you understand how to make things. In digital media, adding hues creates white. Now, why some colors work together and some don't? We want to talk about that a little bit. How paintings and other images are designed. Color is a vital element of composition. The principles that guide successful painters, which are useful. How to mix colors, if only very broadly. Pigments have individual properties, so not all yellow pigment operates the same as all other yellow pigment. And what are the emotional, psychological impacts of colors and their combinations? Colors are classified by three properties, generally speaking, hue, purity, and value. Those that are terms that are often not understood quite exactly right. Experimenting with a graphics program will get the distinctions in your head, though colors mix differently on screen than they do when you're mixing paint or you're drawing with pencils and so on. So hue, the hue is the intrinsic color, the wavelength of the light concern. So here you see the strips of primary, secondary, and tertiary hues. Hue is basically another word for color. Purity. Purity is the freedom from other mad admixtures. Generally speaking, um, you add, you might add white to lighten a color and add black to darken it. The more you do either one, the less uh, purity you have, the less saturation. Value. That's the luminescence, but also purity can also be when you mix, like for example, yellow and orange, you lose purity. Value, the luminance, the brightness or dullness of a hue is measured by the amount of light reflected. Also called the tone or tonal value, a tint is made by adding white to a hue and a shade is made by adding black. As far as oil painting pigments are concerned, mixing in white or black will usually lower the purity of a hue, making it chalkier or muddier. Primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. Um, ideally, uh, in your design uh, fundamentals 107 class, you will have made the basic color wheel like this. The primary colors are, of course, and this is for uh, 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 when you add colors together, not when you uh, when you subtract. Anyway, this is for medium in uh, in real life medium, not for digital medium. Primary colors include yellow blue and red obviously mix those various colors together you mix yellow and blue you get green you mix yellow and red you get orange you mix red and blue you get purple or violet if you mix those again to get a tertiary color you get red orange or yellow orange or green blue and so on those are primary secondary and tertiary colors and the location of these on the color wheel help determine the basic schemes the basic color schemes that we'll talk about as well. So for example, monochromatic color scheme. One hue. This is this painting by Picasso is not a true monochromatic. It has more than one hue, but mostly it's monochromatic. So this is limited, but it's also can be a powerful approach where you have dark blue, light blue, and so on. Complementary colors. Complementary colors are opposite each other on the color wheel. These hues can be mixed in in various proportions. Blue and orange are frequently used for movie posters. This is because of the way the complementary colors pop in general, but also because of the color temperature, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. If you look this up, it's mind-boggling. Almost every action movie is mostly um, orange and blue, sometimes with other colors. Here's some more examples of action movie posters and so on. Almost always orange and blue. Analogous, the composition just uses three hues of a 12 color wheel. So for example, orange, orange, red, and red, or something like that. As before, the hues can be mixed and their tones adjusted. So here you have Delacroix's Death of Sardanopolis, and you can see it is not entirely, but almost entirely analogous colors. Split complementary, it's like analogous, but with the addition of the complementary of the mid-hue of the analogous range. So basically, if you're using uh, purple, red, or uh, I should say red, purple, red, and red, orange, you would use green across from it, right, on the color wheel. So this painting by Mary Cassatt uses tertiary hues and falls somewhere between a triadic scheme and a split complementary one, which is another kind of color scheme, but it mostly falls into uh, a split complementary. Here's another example 
Um, I absolute vodka ad and the 7-Eleven sign. Triadic color. <coughs> it uses all three hues that are equidistant on the color wheel. Hues may be varied in purity and tone as usual, as in this uh, Inherent Vice poster from the movie uh, based on the Thomas Pinchon novel from uh, a few years ago. Now, in addition to those color schemes, and I encourage you to look those up, and I'll include more information when I post your assignment sheet, um, there is the question of color temperature. So look at this painting um, by Bruegel, of the Hunters in the Snow, and then look at this painting of a wedding dance, also by Bruegel. Now you can see the profound difference created by the temperatures of the color. In the painting on the left, the wedding party, it's most, it's not entirely, but it's mostly warm colors. This makes, this brings you closer to the painting. If everything seems closer to you, you're drawn towards it. The painting on the right, the hunters in the snow, it's not entirely, but almost entirely cold in its color scheme, and it seems more distant. This variation in temperature can be used in a number of ways to create depth, to create design dynamics and contrast. Now, there are things that contradict this color scheme that I put up of warm and cold colors. For example, you can have a cold yellow, you can have a warm blue, but generally, spe generally speaking, the colors on the left will tend to be warm and the colors on the right will tend to be cold, unless you find the exact right pigment. Um, for example, you can buy a phthalo blue that is basically cold, you know, and that, you can buy a yellow that is cold, uh, a, a phthalo blue that is warm, you can buy a yellow that is cold and so on. But generally speaking, reds, oranges, yellows, warm, blues, greens, some violets, cold. As I said before, warm tends to pull you in. Cold pushes you away. So warm is read as quote-unquote closer, and cool colors read as farther away. So take this pattern by William Morris from the 19th century arts and crafts movement. Or take this painting by Edward Hopper from the early 20th century. Most of the movie theater is either neutral or very, very warm, with the exception for the most part of the cool uniform, cool colored uniform um, that the uh, uh, movie theater employee is wearing. This sort of heightens how alone she is in comparison to what else is happening in the frame of the painting. This is a typical uh, thing of Edward Hopper underlining the sort of isolation people can feel even in the middle of New York City. As mentioned before, uh, movie theater poster, movie th posters tend to uh, contrast between orange and blue, sometimes with other colors, but definitely orange and blue. Um, this is also because of their temperature difference. In addition to being complementary, they have a profound temperature difference, which makes them really quote unquote pop. Now, color is about meaning and about formal qualities, but it's also about other things. Now, of course, you look at these two panels published three years apart um, of the same comic by EC Comics, Judgment Day, which I've mentioned before. One was colorized, one wasn't. So what do you think the benefits of black and white are? What does that communicate that color doesn't communicate? What does color communicate that black and white can't, and so on? In addition to those formal questions, however, there's also an interplay of commerce and technology. The fact is, they couldn't afford to print the one on the left in color in 1950, but in 1953, they could afford to print the color because technology and, and the economics had shifted. Now, that was still fairly limited, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, we can see the additive primaries. These are different than the subtractive primaries um, that we use when we're making um, paints, mixing paints, and so on. These are the red, green, and blue RGB that you have with computer programs um, and computer screens. If you add red, green, and blue together, you get white. This is different, of course, than the subtractive primaries, where if you add most of the colors together, you get uh, black. Um, this is also different from pre-digital printing, the CMYK process, 
where you have three additive primaries plus black. Cyan, magenta, yellow, and then black to create the color scheme. Of course, artists have been aware of color theory for centuries or longer, but this was only scientifically mapped out in the 19th century or so. Subtractive color is going to be our major concern here. In printing and in comics, this is usually done throughout history by partially transparent printers and in ink uh, using cyan, magenta, and yellow plus black CMYK. But at first, it was very, very expensive. While color boosted sales, it also cost a lot to print. Even major newspapers like the New York Times did not run much in color until the 1990s. Color was restricted in comics as well due to costs. Simple, bold colors were used, a four-color process. Superheroes came to exist in a bright world of primary colors. Colors even became symbols for certain characters, as you can see in the Scott McCloud explanation below. But this also flattened the emotional and expressive aspect of comics. No one color dominated. It was graphically very compelling, but sort of gray emotionally. Compare the Jack Kirby drawing on your left to the two panels from the 1988 Brian Bowen Batman Killing Joke comic. The more limited color scheme may be less graphic on the right, but it conveys more emotional drama. The color scheme in Bowen's drawing contrasts blue and orange, as in movie posters, warm and cool, complementary, while also using the weirder colors of green, purple, and yellow. The temperature of the woman is about to be, who is about to be shot is warm. She's closer to us. We identify with her. Moreover, the temperature of the shooter is cool and neutral. Lastly, there's very little variation in saturation and purity in the Kirby drawing. There's a decent amount of variation in the Bullen drawing. This is due to conceptual differences. The revisionist Batman graphic novels aim to show a more emotional depth, but also changes due to technology and comics. While flat color of comics historically tended to minimize expressiveness and emotion, this could be overcome by dramatically increasing the value contrast by adding a real large and sharp, almost charoscuro-like contrast between light and dark. Well, the, as I said, uh, you can see this charoscuro, these examples um, in the paintings by uh, Gerard von Hothrott and Caravaggio. These are colorfully painted, um, especially for the time, but the high contrast adds drama. High value contrast, I should say. Since the 1970s, there's been an increasingly complex use of color in many comics, although, ironically, the increasing use of digital coloring sometimes pushes back to a more simplistic approach. <clears throat> in addition, approaching color in a limited, quote-unquote, old-fashioned way has cultural connotations that can evoke a gothic relationship to the past, sort of a mixture of antipathy and nostalgia for ways of living that are now over, like in these Chris Ware comics um, about Jimmy Corrigan, the smartest kid on Earth. Now, of course, color schemes can communicate a lot. So you look at these covers of Mouse 1 and 2 by Art Spiegelman. Especially the one on the right. The main characters, the mice, are warm. But they're imprisoned in these cold outfits. Or you can look at these EC comics and ask yourself, what are these color schemes? These are from the 1950s. What do they convey? Or the two covers of uh, Persopolis. Or these covers of Lone Wolf and Cub and a cover of Akira number six. What do these color schemes communicate? Your assignment will be to design a comic cover for the characters you have invented. This will be in color. This will be a last assignment um, for comics. Um, and you're going to decide whether you're going to use a realistic, stylized, or a cartoon version of your character. And you should send a rough draft of that idea to me before you start on your final project. That'll be in the assignment sheet. You want to come up with a compelling overall composition, like we talked about at the beginning of the semester. You're going to decide on your color scheme, and most importantly, why you want to use a color scheme. And again, you need to email me or message me on web campus what color scheme you're going to use and why before you start. Your composition can, but does not have to, include the title of your comic. You could leave a space there, blank, or whatever. 
But this will be due on May 15th. If you do not have access to any way to call her, uh, because uh, we can't go back to campus and I can't get you uh, markers the way I normally do, um, let me know and I will give you an alternative assignment. Uh, so just send me a message either by email or web campus and let me know that you don't have access to colored pencils or watercolors or gouache or watercolor, anything. Um, if you do have access to color, you should do this assignment as is. If you don't because of the general crisis and collapse of everything, well, I'll give you an alternative assignment that I'm designing right now. Um, I will post the assignment sheet for this uh, by probably the midday tomorrow, Tuesday, um, if you're listening to this the day I, I made it. Um, and I will post your next, your other final project uh, within the next couple of days. You should spend at least six or seven hours on this project. And again, you should message me your idea and what color scheme you're going to use before you start. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll talk to you soon.